Hi, this is Emily Horvat, and welcome back to the Expand podcast created by Respi Plus. This content will bring you closer to experts in the respiratory field who will be discussing the best practices with a focus on improving the lives of people living with chronic lung conditions. This podcast is part of a series that explores the journey of people suffering with chronic cough and their healthcare team. Today, we're joined again by Sarah McRae, respiratory therapist and chronic cough patient, as well as Dr. Stephen Field, a respirologist at Foothills Medical Center and clinical professor at the University of Calgary. Practicing for over 40 years, he has won awards for undergraduate, resident, and continuing medical education. He has a large respiratory consultative practice and worked in the tuberculosis, non-tuberculosis mycobacterial, asthma, and CF clinics. He co-founded the Calgary COPD and Asthma Program and founded the Calgary Chronic Cough Clinic. Dr. Field has participated in numerous clinical investigations and published over 100 articles in peer-reviewed journals, as well as many abstracts, book chapters, and communications. Dr. Field is here with us today to discuss his unique experience and expertise with chronic cough clinics and to provide insight as to how other physicians and professionals can begin their own clinic. Good evening, Dr. Field. I'm... um... <clears throat> just going to go right into the questions for you. Sure. And we've got quite a few here, <laughs> so we'll see what we can get through. Sure. Um, why do you feel that cough clinics are necessary um, and do we have enough of them in the area? I, you know, I think that there's a real need for specialized cough clinics. Although patients don't die from chronic cough, it has a major impact on quality of life. And it's a frequent reason for patients to miss work or school. And in some cases, they give up their jobs. You know, you can't work in sales or retail if you're coughing or your client or you or you're speaking to clients on the phone. Uh, I had one patient who was a very successful um, car salesman, and you know he had to give up work, and it was having all sorts of ramifications. You know, you give up your job, there become money issues, that causes uh, you know family discord. Uh, people are coughing, they they self-isolate, you know, you can't go to a movie or a concert, you know what it's like someone's coughing and you want to kill them. And, you know, they're very rare that, you know, these people start coughing and especially in the COVID era, people treat them like typhoid Mary. Absolutely. So these are, these are, are real problems. And, you know, it's not unusual. Cough is the most common symptomatic complaint that patients see their family doctors for. And surveys have suggested that up to 40% of referrals to respiratory specialists uh, are, um, are, due, uh, are due to chronic cough. And this is despite the fact that the majority of these patients don't even have lung disease. You know, the traditional approach of ruling out, uh, uh, you know, or getting patients to stop smoking, avoiding medications that can cause cough like angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, uh, diagnosing and treating asthma, gastroesophageal reflux, uh, upper airway disease is effective in about 70% of the patients that are referred to cough clinics, not just our clinic, but, you know, uh, clinics in the UK, there have been several, that there are several there that are well known. And they also have find that about 70%, uh, about 30% of their patients fail the anatomic based approach. And the, that's because these are patients that have what we call cough hypersensitivity syndrome, which requires a different approach. This is a very interesting condition, I think, in that, you know, it really has parallels to neuropathic pain. And there was a very interesting paper last year that was published that looked at patients with chronic cough who had normal chest x-rays and normal pulmonary function, and they compared them to normal individuals. And what they did is they did bronchoscopic biopsies, and they found that the epithelium, so the bronchial epithelium of the patients with chronic cough had increased nerve fiber density. So there, there may actually be a neuro, 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 neurological basis for uh, chronic cough. Interestingly, uh, these patients can respond to speech therapy techniques, and it's important that the approach to them include education. They have to understand. Uh, I mean, the first thing I tell them is, is that, you know, this is a this is, and so many of them come in fearful that they've got something that's going to kill them. And so we reassure them that that's not the case and that the issue is quality of life. And so that, you know, we're not trivializing the fact that it's not dangerous, but they have to understand that, you know, that, you know, they need to be reassured, but it is a quality of life issue. And for that reason, it is important. And, you know, these patients, we teach them cough avoidance and suppress cough suppressive techniques and also breathing exercises to help them disrupt coughing jags. 
And, you know, as I said, it's, you know, the parallels with neuropathic pain are interesting and some of the medications used to treat neuropathic pain, like gabapentin and pregabalin, uh, have been tried in these patients with some success. But I think it's important to understand which patients should be given these medications and which sh shouldn't. And so for all these reasons, I think we need specialized cough clinics. I would agree with you completely there. And as somebody with the chronic cough, yeah, I think I've tried all those things. So yeah, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, in your opinion, the ideal structure for one of these chronic cough clinics would be what? Well, I mean, there's a... Well, well, first of all, we'll talk about the ideal structure, and then we'll talk about reality, okay? So I think that the person in charge should be a respiratory specialist, because I think it's important to screen out and manage patients with respiratory disorders such as COPD, bronchiectasis, cancer, and other lung diseases, and also conditions that can mimic lung disease, so including heart disease that can present with cough. So it's important that we make sure that we're not missing important, potentially life-threatening diseases. Uh, these are not the patients that should be managed by a non-physician healthcare professional. And so I think it's important that that initial review be done by a respiratory specialist. Ideally, a cough clinic would have dedicated educators to assess and manage the patients. There needs to be access to a pulmonary function lab and diagnostic imaging and a spit and a trained speech specialist are, would, are ideal. You know, we also we should have prompt access to GI and ENT specialists, uh, sorry, GI, ENT and allergy specialists, and occasionally other specialists. And a psychologist would also be very useful. So that is, that would be my ideal structure for a clinic. And that makes the, the, the dream team. The dream team, absolutely. And I would completely agree with you on that one. So to some groups and clinicians out there, that might sound a tad bit harrowing and a tad bit overwhelming. The minimum requirements that you could have for a ideal structure or a realistic structure, as you said, um, for a clinic would be what? So, you know, obviously we'd like to have a fully staffed cough clinic, but budgets being what they are, that has not been possible. We've been managing with a trained cough specialist, okay, who's actually a certified respiratory educator, who explains the details of chronic cough and has also been teaching the patients cough avoidance and cough suppressive strategies, as well as breathing exercises to disrupt the coughing jags. And with this, um, uh, this cough clinic structure, we've seen over, well over 3,000 chronic cough referrals in our clinic and we have a very reasonable uh, success rate. So I think that if you're obliged, you can manage with less, but you know, ideally it would be nice to have a little more support. Oh, for sure, for sure, for sure. And I know myself as a respiratory therapist and a CRE, you know, just going through this process with all of you guys on the chronic cough papers and doing the podcast, I've learned so much for our patients. Like it's, it's very, very important information that's going out there. So we thank you for that. And on that note, if we have a doctor here looking to set up a clinic, what would be the challenges you've seen or what would be the advice you would give them in doing that? Let me, just before I go into that, let me just add Absolutely. one other thing to my third, uh, to, the, to the third question you asked. Absolutely. And that is, is that, I mean, the, the choice of, you know, in a trim down clinic, you know, the, the choice of, um, Healthcare professionals, I think, is important. When we started, when we started the program, I thought to myself, well, you know, if I had a nurse practitioner in there, it would be almost like having a doctor, and that would really wouldn't be any different. And obviously, you know, budgets being what they are, I thought that you know a CRE would be a reasonable alternative. And you have to remember that the differential diagnosis of chronic cough parallels that of asthma. And that's an area that uh, CREs are, have expertise in. And that's why we decided to go with the CRE. And, and that, you know, that has worked very well. And, uh, you, know, you know, and I think that, you know, given the financial constraints that we talked about, I think that that is a reasonable individual to be the go-to person in these sort of clinics. Obviously with the, um, you know, in the background, you need to have a respiratory specialist. Uh, now, getting, getting this going is, you know, one of these clinics going is a challenge. 
So we were lucky, very lucky in 2004, there was some extra money around and you know the government came to us and said, we would like to see some innovation. And so people put in proposals for innovative clinics. And so that, that's when we got the cough clinic approved. And so I think that the biggest challenge is convincing administrators to invest in yet another project in this, uh, in this uh, era of fiscal res restraint. The best argument with authorities is financial. We showed that our patients had been coughing for an average of more than five years on average. And over that period, some of them had been seen by uh, at least six different times by, by various specialists. They'd undergone many investigations and been prescribed various medications and treatments, all of which cost the system. We also showed that the cost of, a C of the CRE model was substantially less than having these patients managed by physicians. And they were at least as well or better managed depending on the parameter measured. So I think that there's, you know, that there, you've got to make that sort of argument to convince people. The other thing that no one ever mentions and is very important are the indirect costs of missed work and disability payments. I mean, I'm shocked at how many patients come into my office and I find out that they're on disability because of their cough or they've given up their jobs. And, you know, and I felt that it was important to actually validate what we did. And so we actually published our results in peer in peer reviewed peer reviewed journals. And we showed that, you know, that we were successful. And the cost analysis was also also made it through the peer review process. So I think that we validated this model. And although people might, you know, hypothesize one thing or another, this sort of model works. And it is a reasonably, it is a reasonable way to go, uh, both from, you know, the patient outcome and the financial perspectives. That's, that's really good information. And I would completely agree with you. Um, <clears throat> The only other question I guess I would have for you is if doctors or RTs, CREs, anybody out there in the field right now that is wanting to send patients of theirs to a cough clinic, is there a site they can go to specifically to download referrals? And if, if so, if not, do you have any idea what the wait times are right now? Because I'm sure they're going to go up with the post-COVID cough too. So I didn't mention it, but that was another argument we used for our cough clinic. So, I mean, cough patients get referred to respiratory specialists. Yes. And the majority of the patients don't even have lung disease once you screen out the patients with obvious, you know, uh, obvious underlying lung disease. Right. And so you have, you have a group of patients that get referred to respiratory doctors who are not particularly interested in seeing patients who don't have lung disease. And in our city, a lot of the respiratory specialists were refusing to see these patients. So there were, the wait list was up in around the year range. And so that was one of the other reasons for bringing in the cough clinic. Right now, I mean, I, I'm seeing patients, we're, we're seeing patients in our cough clinic who've been referred in April and May. And, you know, the, the biggest delay is just, you know, uh, you know, we get a referral and the patient has, for example, had a chest x-rays or pulmonary function tests, getting those things performed before we actually see the patients. So we've, we've really, basically, our, our wait list has evaporated. And actually, the other thing is, is that part of the apparent wait list is that patients get offered an appointment and it's not convenient for them. So by the time they actually come, it appears that they've waited longer than they've really had to. So I think that this sort of, this model is, is potentially something that could be exported other places. I'd love to see it happen. We've actually have our cough clinic running on three different sites in Calgary, okay, in addition to the major clinic that we have here at the Foothills Hospital, we have one running at the Peter Lloyd Hospital and one at South Health Campus, which is about 30 kilometers away from us. We've had interest, we've had uh, people sent, you know, primarily respiratory therapists and nurses sent to our clinic from various places in Alberta to see what we're doing, from BC, Saskatchewan. Uh, you know, we get emails from all over the country from patients. I've and ones from the states also, but because of the whole uh, medical liability thing, we uh, you know, I we we don't really want to deal with people that are in the states. 
you know, if I get, you know, I've had a number of, of emails from people from Ontario and I've been referring them to the McMaster Clinic. I mean, I hate to see them spend the money to come all the way out to Calgary when you could drive from Toronto to uh, Hamilton. Uh, but so I think that, I think there's a real need. I think that we, you know, we could easily accommodate anywhere from six to 10 of these clinics across the country and they would all be reasonably busy. Yeah, I would have to agree with you on that. And it's something, one of these days I'm coming to Calgary to see your clinic because I've done the McMaster Clinic and they're wonderful, but I'm very interested in the way you guys have your, um, your clinic set up. So that sounds fantastic. Ours, ours is, you know, I think that uh, Imran's clinic is, you know, much more detailed. It's much more research focused than ours. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, we're, I think that ours is more, you know, within most centers budgets, let's put it that way. Well, and you guys talked a lot about the um, speech therapy part of it, and that I find very interesting. I would like to see a bit more of that. Well, so I'll tell you what happened. So Diane Conley, who's since retired, Right. Uh, actually went to um, Vancouver, spent a few days in Vancouver in Murray Morrison's clinic. Murray Morrison is now retired, okay. but he was in, he, he was the ENT guy that was seeing all of the singers, all of, you know, people, he was seeing people with vocal cord dysfunction right, uh, and all sorts of those sorts of functional voice disorders. And so we went there, saw the techniques they were using and we and we and he would very generously showed us how to do these things and so we've been doing them here and they work reasonably well for a lot of the patients not for everyone no not for everyone you know i would say the patients get referred to us i mean a lot of them are pretty straightforward and you know they've uh, you know we they turn out to have you know reactive airway disease or you know obviously have reflux that's inadequately treated um in Calgary, just because it's so dry, we see lots of people with, uh, you know, more uh, upper airway cough than other things. You know, uh, you know, people, it's just so dry here. And so that, you know, will deal primarily with hydration. You know, if they're, uh, you know, if their cough is bothering them at night, we'll use some of the first generation antihistamines that have a bit of a sedating effect. So, I mean, you know, there's, they're all, we see all of these sorts of things. And then, Occasionally, someone slips through the system and turns out to have a serious condition. We, we miss a few people with mild bronchiectasis, which I'm not too concerned about because we do eventually pick them up because they keep coughing and eventually we'll do a CT scan on them. But, you know, every so often someone shows up and has something serious. Uh, we've had, I can't think of any tumors. We haven't had any cancers, uh, but we've had some people with interstitial lung disease you know, with normal chest x-rays, but eventually we do a CT scan and we see they have interstitial disease. So we've had several of those For sure. uh, system, you know, who, you know, initially, and when we initially see them, they're relatively mild, but eventually, you know, the condition manifests. But the majority of others, it's kind of the, 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 um, the spectrum of people you would expect to have chronic cough with a normal chest x-ray. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for your time tonight. I could ask you questions for hours, but that's what we're supposed to discuss this evening. So we'll have to leave that for another podcast. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Dr. Phil. Hey, Sarah and everyone else. Have a good, have a good evening. Take care. Bye now. Today. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed it and were able to get a few insights from our speakers. Make sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss the upcoming episodes. We'll be publishing a new podcast the first week of every month, so stay tuned. You can also follow us on various social media platforms. Just look for Expand Courses by Rescue Plus.